Thank you. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 40. Members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. I have a point of order from Alexander Burnett online. The, uh, the PIN number wasn't shared with those people online. and As a result, I wasn't able to vote in time. Uh, I would have voted yes. Thank you, members. If we could maybe ask Mr. Burnett to please repeat, because I didn't actually hear what. I would say that the, the incorrect photo is appearing against Mr. Burnett's name, but notwithstanding that, could I ask Mr. Burnett please to repeat? Members, could I ask Mr. Burnett to please repeat his point? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, the PIN number wasn't shared. Uh, in the normal way with those people online. Uh, I wasn't able to join and vote in time. I would have voted yes. Mr Burnett, are you saying you would have voted yes? Correct. Correct. Thank you. That will be recorded. I, my understanding is that the pin was sh number was shared. Thank you. I now have a point of order from Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, I did have the PIN number and it still didn't work. Um, I would have voted no, but thank you. Thank you, Mr Kidd. That will be recorded, as will Mr Burnett's point. I have a point of order from Richard Lockett. Uh, my app wouldn't connect. I'd have voted no. Thank you, Mr Lockett. That uh, will be recorded. I have a point of order from Mary McCallan online. Presiding officer, likewise, I didn't have the pen. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms McCallan. Uh, uh, that vote will be recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 40 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes 46, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call group two on meaning of child. I call amendment 41 in the name of Russell Finlay, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I call on Russell Finlay to move amendment 41 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. I speak to amendment 41 in my name along with 28 other consequential amendments. Um, the amendment was submitted in consultation with Victim Support Scotland and while this bill will make significant changes to Scotland's criminal justice system, it was decided by Parliament that it should be dealt with by the Education rather than the Justice Committee. Understandable, given the abundance of substantial and complex legislation passing through the Justice Committee, committee. but also a matter of concern that neither I nor my Justice Committee colleagues have had meaningful opportunity to engage with this bill. Now, during stage two, I lodged four amendments and supported one other in the name of Ros McCall. And due to a calendar clash with the Justice Committee, my colleague Liam Kerr kindly spoke to my amendments at stage two. These amendments were unsuccessful, although some did secure cross-party support. However, serious concerns remain, and this is our last opportunity to address them. The bill raises the maximum age for referral to the Children's Panel from 16 to 18, 
and Amendment 44 would remove this section from the Bill. Put simply, the age limit for referral would therefore remain at 16. And I need to make it clear that this amendment does not apply to any provisions in the Bill relating to young offenders' institutes or places where children can be detained. I also understand that Amendment 41 may not sit easily alongside the UNCRC. However, the amendment is mostly probing in its nature, and I may not push it to a vote. However, I think it is very important for the Minister today to meaningfully address what her government is doing to ensure the panel system will be able to cope with the expected influx of new cases. The same goes for criminal justice social work, who are already struggling. The government keeps adding to their workload. Just last year, they gave them more to do with the bail and release from custody legislation. Now, the minister told the Education Committee that increasing the age to 18 would see up to 8,000 more referrals to the panel each year. This would result in thousands more panel hearings. Yet the system is already struggling to recruit volunteers and admits that it will be a challenge to meet the significant new demand. Then there is the cost, with the panel saying their costs alone could rise by 42 per cent. So I would like the Minister to put on record today an explicit commitment that her government's legislation will not end up harming young people. And I know that is not her intent. But if these public services are not ready for this new law, more crime victims will inevitably suffer. We already know that many of these victims will be young people, kids who have suffered life-changing harm, violent attacks filmed in mobile phones, unable to leave their homes or return to school, trust shattered, education disrupted, lives destroyed. And they are left traumatised in need of help which they do not get and watch helplessly as their attackers are given support. They are deprived of information and often deprived of justice. So the, gov the government should not use legislation to virtue signal if their actions will then cause real life harms, especially to young people. A system unprepared is a system where mistakes will happen. And if the Minister cannot give these explicit commitments, then she should be candid and accept this amendment and the other amendments in the group. And if that is the case, she must press pause for the sake of child crime victims, other victims and the professionals who are being expected to make this law work in the real world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I call Willie Rennie. Uh, Russell Finlay's amendments eviscerate the heart of this bill, to be frank. Uh, if passed, it would keep more children in the criminal justice system. Now, the amendments undermine the promise which the Conservatives signed up to previously. They go against the general principles of the bill, which were agreed at stage one by the Conservatives, are incompatible with the UNCRC, which this Parliament also supported to be incorporated into the law, which the Conservatives also supported, undermine the approach of his Conservative colleagues also on the Education Committee. So just how many U-turns is Russell Finlay prepared to do in one day? Uh, certainly. Russell Finlay? No, uh I, th I thank Mr Rennie for his intervention. I think he perhaps wrote that before he listened to what I said. I mean, the point I'm making is this is mostly a probing amendment, and it's really up to the government to explain the incompatibility or the, the workability of this legislation and explain the, the compatibility with the UA, UCA, CRC. Willie Rennie. Of course there are ways to do that, and uh, Pam Duncan glances amendments later on probe the issue about resources, but to blow a hole in the middle of the whole bill by removing the provision of moving up to 18 is a dramatic step. There's much more effective ways of doing this, and I suspect it reveals the actual instincts of the Conservatives who don't actually support uh, the major provisions in this bill. And as Megan Gallagher, his colleague, said yesterday, we should allow kids to be kids. 
The impact on the right of victims as a result of this change has rightly been the focus of the debate. It's important that we consider the impact on victims. But my amendments that are going to come on to later on deal with that issue. Of course, resources are a factor. It's been a subject of the debate throughout the whole of the proceedings, from stage one to stage two. And that's why we've been pressing the Minister throughout, and we will press the Minister later on. But to resort to this kind of measure in order to remove it, to make the point, the political point that Russell Finlay is trying to make, I think is inappropriate. Thank you, Mr Rennie. And I call on the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I share a lot of Willie Rennie's sentiments. I'm actually really disappointed to see a lot of these amendments come up today after a lot of it was discussed at stage two. And I actually don't agree with Russell Findlay's take on a lot of this. The group of amendments proposed go against the key principles of the bill as endorsed by Parliament at both stages one and two to ensure all children under the age of 18 years have access to age-appropriate support when in the care and justice system. 16 and 17 year olds can already access the hearing system and I'm confident about the, you know I've spoke to secure care centres I've spoke to children's hearing Scotland about this I've I speak to stakeholders regularly about this and I'm confident about the capacity in the system to deal with this these amendments go against the incorporation of the UNCRC, which clearly states that all people under 18 are children and our commitment to keeping the promise, which I, I don't know if Russell Findlay actually mentioned, which has advocated for maximising the use of the hearing system for 16 and 17 year olds, both of which have had cross-party support. These amendments run contrary to that. The Conservatives cannot take a pick-and-mix approach to the promise. They would already said that they back the promise in full. That is a commitment that they have made along with other parties in this chamber to care experienced people in Scotland. And I appreciate the member has said that he may not press the amendments. Now is not the time to take a backward step and hinder the progress that Scotland has made to its approach to youth justice. Rather, we should ensure that we are doing what is best for Scotland's children and young people, advocating for their rights and ensuring best outcomes. Presiding officer, I will now consider the amendments proposed. Amendments 41 and 59 to 62 intend to remove sections 1 and 8 through 11, which amend the statute book to provide that a child is someone under the age of 18. Similarly, amendments 50 to 53, 71, 73, 79 and 94 all provide changes that seek to retain the position whereby children are considered to be those under 16 rather than under 18. Amendments 69, 70, 72, 74 to 78 and 83 again reaffirm that the Conservatives do not believe that the definition of children is all people under 18, as do amendments 90, 91 and 92. Amendments 93, 95 and 97 remove key explanatory wording in the long title that outlines what this bill intends to do for Scotland's children, that all under-18s will be under the scope of the children's hearing and that all under-18s are considered children in the criminal justice system. Amendment 96 wishes to make a minor technical change to clarify what system is being referenced within the long title. However, I do not think that is necessary. The majority of the, these amendments go against the entire premise of this bill, which is why I would ask again that Mr Findlay not press amendments 41, 50 to 53, 59 to 62, 69 to 79, 83, 90 to 97. Thank you, Minister. I call on Russell Finlay to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 41. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. And I begin by uh, disagreeing with Willie Rennie on this being a political point. This is about making law that works in the real world, and there are sufficient concerns. And both uh, Mr Rennie and the Minister don't seem to have paid any attention to the fact that it's Victim Support Scotland who suggested this amendment because they are so concerned about the failings that are uh, potentially facing the entire system in, resp in response of this uh, age increasing from 16 to 18. It is them who are suggesting that the, the, the difficulties are so extreme, potentially, that we need to go down this route. Um, that said, I, I made it clear from the outset that this was, in all likelihood, a probing amendment. I make no apologies for uh, raising the concerns of Victim Support Scotland, uh, on behalf of crime victims in Scotland, and uh, I will not push it to vote, but I thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I would advise the Chamber that Russell Finlay seeks to withdraw Amendment 41. Does any member object? No member objects. Therefore, Amendment 41 is withdrawn. Could I just take this opportunity to say to members that we have looked into the difficulties regarding the PIN. I understand that the PIN was shared initially, albeit that some members, for other reasons, did not see it. Uh, and therefore, I hope that the matter has now been resolved, and I do apologise for any confusion uh, that was caused in particular to Mr Burnett and Ms McCallan, who raised the issue. We will now turn to Group 3, Children's Hearing System, Ways of Working and Training. I call Amendment 42 in the name of Pam Duncan Vancey, grouped with Amendments 44, 46 and 57. I call on Pam Duncan Glancy to move Amendment 42 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. In speaking to these amendments, I want to be clear that throughout this process, Scottish Labour's approach has been to secure a system that promotes and protects the rights and welfare of the children and young people who come into contact with it. In doing so, we have paid close attention to the Keeping the Promise report and Sheriff Mackey's reports, which both looked in detail at the ways in which the children's hearing system could be redesigned to meet those aims. A key recommendation set out by Sheriff Mackey in his report is that everyone working within the system should be equipped to work alongside children and their families, understand their rights and how things that have happened in their lives have had an impact on who they are and what they do. And it is on, the basis, it is on that basis that I have lodged Amendment 42 on embedding a trauma-informed approach and 57 on training. Amendment 42 sets out matters which the National Convener must have regard to in training or making arrangements for the training of children's hearing panel members, places a duty on children's hearing pa panel or pre-hearing panel to have due regard to the need to treat a child to whom a hearing relates in a way that takes account of the effects of trauma which the child may have experienced and seeks to avoid or minimise the risk of exposing the child to any recurrence of past trauma or further trauma. New Section 7A would also require the National Convener to ensure that a hearing or pre-hearing panel has due regard to the need to treat the child in this way. Members will know that the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 already allows the Convener to offer training to panel members, but beyond the duty to have regard to the need to provide training on how best to hear the views of the child to whom the hearing relates, the existing legislation does not set out requirements in the areas which panel members should be trained, specifically um, with the, the um, increase in age in, in the Bill and the associated situations and hearings that will come before the panel. Amendment 42 includes measures on this. And in keeping with the recommendation from Sheriff Mackey and the promise that I previously highlighted, Amendment 57 seeks out, uh, sets out the training that will be needed. I believe it is crucial that we ensure all panel members are able to recognise the age and circumstance specific needs of the children and young people they are working with in order to provide appropriate and sensitive care throughout the train, through, uh, through training on child development able to uphold the principles of fairness, equality, rights and respect through an understanding of children's rights and be able to identify signs of trauma and of abuse and address immediately safety concerns and minimise the risk of causing further or recurrence of trauma through training on domestic abuse and trauma-informed practice. And whilst I recognise some panel members will have had some training in these areas, there is no legislative basis on that as it stands. This amendment seeks to change that. Presiding officer, when Who Cares Scotland looked into training on trauma in particular um, informed practice at local authority level, they found that just nine councils were able to report a level of training for staff and a further 11 were unable to provide this feedback as they did not collect the data. That is why my amendment 57 seeks to create a duty for training that is set out clearly in legislation. Beyond training, it is important that the system as a whole adopts a trauma informed approach many of the children who come into contact with the hearing system, regardless of the grounds on which they are referred, will have had adverse childhood experiences, and the system must be designed to recognise that. I know the Government recognised the importance of this, and I am grateful to the Minister for taking the time to discuss this area with me following Stage 2. The amendment I have brought forward today has sought to better align the terminology with the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill, which had known to be problem problematic, and so I hope it will receive, um, at this point, government support. <laughs>
Before I come to a close, I want to quickly touch on the other amendments in the group. On Amendment 46, in the name of Martin Whitfield, a multi-agency approach to supporting children involving a criminal proceeding is vital to comprehensively address the diverse needs of children, and I would urge members to support it. I will also be supporting Amendment 44, in Mar Martin Whitfield's name, on non-discrimination in the system to ensure the principle of equality is upheld. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you, Ms Duncan Glancy. I now call on Martin Whitfield to speak to Amendment 44 and other amendments in the group. Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. The two amendments that sit in my name in this group <clears throat> deal with two different and specific matters. The first, which again, I would imagine that we can all agree on, is that a discriminatory approach would not be exercised because of a protected characteristic of a young person who came before a hearing panel or court. And what this amendment seeks to do is to place that firmly within the 2011 Act, so that should should an occurrence occur, a young person could have that properly investigated. Amendment 46, for which I also thank Bernardo Scotland for their support and respect of this matter, is to open up the discussion which I brought in the earlier group of amendments about what is the best way to deal with young people who come before or have an interaction with the state in the widest sense. The use of a multi-agency approach would allow the right answer for the young person that is in front of the panel to be dealt with. And the purpose behind this amendment is to do exactly that, to empower, empower the children's hearing to take a multi-agency approach so that they fully and properly understand and fully and properly support the young person to whom the hearing relates. With regard to the other matters, I would be astounded if anyone in this chamber um, is not already of the view that I will be supporting my colleague Pam Dun Duncan Glancy in respect of amendments 42 and 47. And particularly with regard to 42, the importance that we now understand of an appropriate training with regard to trauma to fully understand not just young people but lots of people who come before panel but with regard to this bill we are talking about young people um, and with regard to the, to the um, final matter obviously um, the, the, the concept of training has to be fundamental um, to the volunteers and those that will sit on this panel so I move those hands in my name. <clears throat> Thank you Mr Whitfield. I call Ros McCall. Apologies, presiding officer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I note the amendments in this group, numbers 42, 44, 46 and 57, and their focus on trauma-informed practices. And I would like to focus my remarks particularly on amendments 42 and 57. And in addition, I would like to thank Scottish Women's Aid and Victim Support Scotland for their helpful comments on these amendments. Victim Support Scotland have been very vocal in their concern and I quote them when they say that the process, processed increase in the age of referral to children's hearing will likely see an increase in cases involving gender-based violence being dis disposed to the system. And they believe that it's vital that reporters and children's panel members are equipped with robust domestic abuse training to ensure preparedness to manage these cases. Domestic abuse in relationships involving young people can present in complex ways, and understanding the totality of risk is vital to ensuring a victim is adequately supported with information and safeguarding. And we've also got Scottish Women's Aid highlighting a trauma-informed approach for all victims, including those who are subject child of a children's hearing and are supportive of these amendments coming through. And on these benches, we echo those sentiments and recognise the importance of training and the process that are trauma-informed, and therefore we will be supporting all the amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCall, and I call Willie Rennie. Yeah, we'll be supporting all the amendments in this group as well, and I think there's been quite a creative process between uh, the two Labour members and the government after the discussion at stage two. They took away the, the criticisms from the Minister of the Amendments and made changes and uh, brought forward these new amendments, which I think are worthy of support. This is a big change. As Ros McCall has just set out, moving it up to the age of 18 will bring in a different cohort eh, of young people into the system. The level of training that will be required will be much more substantial. And it's quite clear just now the level of training is patchy, it's inadequate and it needs to change. So I think we as a parliament need to have comfort that the system understands how important we regard the level of training, particularly with this degree of change. So we need a greater emphasis on training. 
we need to have a more prescriptive uh, approach to it, specifically mentioning the domestic abuse, which will be a key part of the new cohort of young people that will come into the system. Uh, but we also need some consistency across the country, but also it needs to be consistent with best practice just now. And I don't think it's sufficient for the Minister to say, this has already been done. This Parliament needs to have comfort that it will always be done, and it will always be done on a consistent basis across the country, which is why we support these amendments. Thank you, Mr Rennie. I call the Minister. President Officer, I am glad to offer my support to Pam Duncan Glancy's Amendment 42. The Scottish Government agrees that all children referred to a hearing should be treated in a way that is sensitive to the trauma that they may have experienced. On Martin Whitfield's Amendment 44, I understand it seeks to ensure that decision makers in a children's hearing do not discriminate against the child on any of the grounds mentioned. As discussed with the member at Stage 2, we appreciate the intention behind this amendment, but because existing law and practice achieve what I understand this amendment seeks to do, it is not necessary. There are a range of statutory duties that already apply to children's hearings, which oblige them to protect children's rights and not unlawfully discriminate against a child. These include non-discrimination duties in the public sector equality duty in the Equality Act 2010, and the requirement under the Human Rights Act 1998 to act compatibly with ECHR rights, including Article 14 on non-discrimination. This will then be supplemented by the duty to act compatibly with the requirements in the UNCRC Incorporation Act 24 when that Act comes into force in July. All of these duties combine to protect children from discrimination more robustly than Amendment 44 would, while still allowing the flexibility for decision makers to recognise that it may be necessary to treat, to treat children differently on the basis of, say, their age in certain circumstances. For example, it would only be appropriate to share information with a child who is old enough to understand. Further, whilst I note that the member has added a new provision to his amendment stating it is without prejudice to any other enactment prohibiting discrimination, I'm afraid this doesn't allay the legislative competence concerns that we raised at stage two and instead adds legal uncertainty. We remain concerned that this amendment may make provision in relation to the reserved matter of equal opportunities and may impermissibly modify the Equality Act 2010. I therefore cannot support Amendment 44. On Amendment 46, the Scottish Government does not feel it is necessary to create a legal duty on children's hearings to promote a multi-agency approach to planning support for children. There are existing statutory measures in place under Part 3 of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, which ensure that local authorities and health boards produce children's services plans with a view to safeguarding, supporting and promoting the well-being of children in their area, delivering timely support to meet their needs and delivering services in the most integrated way for children. Amongst others, the National Convener of Children's Hearing Scotland is to participate in or con contribute to these plans, which ensure that practitioners within the hearing system and beyond can effectively collaborate and take a multi-agency practice approach. We would not wish to undermine the shared responsibility of implementing the GERFEC multi-agency approach at all levels of the system by imposing a new and narrow duty on children's hearings. On that basis, I cannot support Amendment 46. Amendment 57 on the training of panel members is clearly an important area. However, I set out government concerns about this at stage two, and those concerns remain. So I'll take the intervention. Pam Duncan Clancy. Th thank you, Minister, for taking the intervention. Um, and, and I note that, that she highlighted children's services plans that local authorities produce, but I think it's fairly widely known that there are still difficulties with organisations um, working together in, in the joined up way that is needed. But I don't, I, I'm not sure I fully understand why this would be a problem for, for the, the bill, because in a lot of the evidence that we heard, and indeed in the reviews, including by The Promise and by Sheriff Mackey and others, have all said that joint working and multi-agency support to make this work um, is incredibly important. Social Work Scotland gave evidence um, to the committee in that respect. So I, I'm still not sure why not including it here um, is, is the way the, the Minister wants to go. Minister. Laid out, there's already an expectation that practitioners and that work, they work in accordance with both legislation and policy guidance, and that multi-agency approach is adhered to. I, if, if the member believes that more work in that is needed, then that is something that we can look at. But I, I don't believe the narrow scope of this amendment will improve the matter. Now, 
Amendment 57, as I said, we are supportive of Ms Duncan Glancy's Amendment 42, which already specifies the importance of trauma training. This recognises the fact that all children referred to a hearing should expect to be treated in a way which is sensitive to their trauma. However, the need for further training matters to be specified in the 2011 Act remains unclear, and we consider duplicate reference to trauma in these provisions would be unnecessary and confusing. On child development, as advised at Stage 2, the CHS guidance currently issued to panel member states, panel members are not and should not attempt to be seen as child development specialists. Where a hearing needs specialist input to decide what measures to put in place for a child, they are able to call on expertise and obtain reports to assist them with this. On domestic abuse, I must reiterate that domestic abuse is one of many child welfare concerns which may come before a hearing and will not be a relevant consideration consideration in all cases. Nonetheless, the impact of domestic abuse forms an important part of existing trauma training for panel members. Similarly, training on children's rights is currently provided to all new panel members and is, a, is an essential part of pre-service training. I am grateful to Ms Duncan Glancy for her work on Amendment 42, which was scoped with government officials and key stakeholders, including the National Convener, to ensure that it is operationally viable. To my knowledge, Amendment 57 has not been subject to any consultation with the National Convener to whom its duties would relate. But as I have explained, I am confident that the comprehensive training provided to panel members by the National Convener and Children's Hearing Scotland covers the key aspects mentioned in Amendment 57, and that panel members are well equipped to deal with the most challenging cases that come before them. So, in summary, I would urge members to support Amendment 42, and if they are moved, to reject Amendments 44, 46 and 57. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Pam Duncan Glancy to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 42. Thank, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I will press Amendment uh, 42. In, in winding up, I am disappointed to hear the government say that because um, domestic abuse and uh, trauma and children's rights are other areas that, that can be offered in training, that they think it's a reason not to put it on the face of a piece of legislation that is so fundamental to children's rights, that is so fundamental um, to trauma, and that as a result of the changes that this bill seeks um, to, to make, will see likely more cases that will involve domestic abuse. And so I think putting that, as I would call it, above the line in the legislation as opposed to below the line um, in assumptions about the sorts of training that people may get rather than should get, um, I think is a real disappointment. And I believe other organisations, particularly um, the uh, various organisations, including the, the Children's Commissioner and um, Victim Support Scotland and others, have all said that training is incredibly important in this regard. Um, on Martin Whitfield's amendment number 46, again, I remain disappointed that not, the, the, the government not being willing to put this specifically in the bill, recognising the importance of multi-agency work. We need to do everything that is at all possible to make sure that any changes in these regards have the best chance of success. And to do that, we need agencies to work together. I don't believe we can leave that to plans at local authority level, but indeed it is important for us to set out in legislation that there are expectations that agencies will work together in that regard. And so I'm disappointed um, that the, the, the government don't feel they're able to support that. Um, finally, um, on the, the Amendment 42, I'm grateful for the engagement um, and I'm, I'm grateful that the, the government will support that amendment on trauma-informed approach because I think it is important um, that the panel take this approach. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. And uh, the question is that Amendment uh, 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 43 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already, already debated with Amendment 40. Martin Whitfield, to move or not move? Move. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, no. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
Uh, the vote is now closed. I have a point of order from Pam Gozo online. Yes. Presiding officer, I would have voted yes. I don't think I got the connection. She has, she has. Uh, I can assure Ms Gozo that her vote was recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 43 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes, 48, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 44 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with amendment 42. Martin Whitfield to move or not move? Move. Deputy Thank you. Uh, the question therefore is that amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 44 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes, 47. No, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 45 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Already debated with amendment 40. Martin Whitfield to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. The question is, I sorry, I call amendment 46 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Already debated with amendment 42. Martin Whitfield to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is, therefore, that amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has not agreed, uh, therefore there will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Shirley Ann Somerville. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. I'm having difficulties connection. I would have voted no. Thank you, uh, Ms Somerville. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 46 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes, 47, 
No, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 47. In the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment 40. Martin Whitfield, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 47 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes 43, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now turn to group four on compulsory supervision orders. I call amendment two in the name of Ros McCall in a group of its own. I call Ros McCall to move and to speak to amendment two. Thank you, presiding officer. And I will be amend moving amendment two in my name. Risk to the victim and risk planning is one of the main areas of concern with proceeding through a children's hearing pan. Victim Support Scotland have consistently raised concerns throughout the progression of the bill regarding the ineffectiveness of compulsory supervision orders as a safeguard for victims. And let me be clear, this is about keeping some of the rights that are currently there in the judicial system that will be lost as we move forward. In the current judicial system for 16 and 17 year olds, any restricted movement conditions are legally binding and it allows the victim to plan their lives and avoid contact. As the policy memorandum of the bill states, there is no such thing as a breach of an MRC. And then it leads me to question the effectiveness of ever using a movement restriction condition. We are effectively stating that if we apply a restriction condition to limit the whereabouts of a person, or limit the times a person can be out in the community. But there's absolutely nothing that can be done if they refuse to comply or slowly erode the trust placed in them. Presiding officer, then we will be powerless to adequately support victims in this case. Victim Support Scotland in their submission highlighted their concerns are further compounded by the sheer lack of MRCs that have been used in the current process, resulting in a lack of information and evidence on how these can effectively restrict the movement of an offending child to protect the victim. So this amendment seeks to put in a safeguarding measure that will only apply if a person does not adhere to the stipulations of an imposed CSO. Anyone who proceeds through the children's hearing panel who had their movement restrictions, restricted, sorry, that sticks to those stipulations set by the panel will not be affected in any way. It is imperative that victims can move on from the incident in a safe, risk-free way, and I urge members to support this amendment that I will be moving. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCall. I call Willie Rennie. I, I get the concerns that Ros McCall has, has raised uh, in this area, and I understand uh, the deep concerns that victim support uh, have got, but we don't need to resort to fines in order to deal with the consequences of non-compliance. Um, Children's Commissioner is very clear that they think that the approach has been taken by the member is contrary to the co-branding principles. And this is very important that we maintain that as part of this bill. And Scottish Women's Aid, equally, are also concerned that the amendment is punitive and doesn't align with the bill's aspirations to strengthen children's rights. They've highlighted the importance of robust guidance on how non-compliance with MRCs will be dealt with. So we don't have to resort to fines. 
We have got other mechanisms, but I, I know the Minister is listening very carefully to the deep concerns that there are in the community about the, the lack of the terminology of breach, but we do not need to go down the route of fines in order to deal with this, so I will be voting against the amendment too. Thank you, Mr Rennie. I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. This amendment fundamentally misunderstands the children's hearing system, which is not a criminal justice system for children. The hearing system is designed to support children who are in need of compulsory measures of care. This bill does not change that. It also does not interfere with the fundamental principle that it is the Lord Advocate who is in charge of prosecution policy in Scotland. It would be entirely inappropriate for this amendment to be passed, and I would urge the member not to move it. A criminal sanction against the child has no place in the children's hearing system. A hearing has extensive powers, and it can take measures such as imposing the conditions mentioned in the amendment to prohibit a child from approaching someone or restricting the liberty of a child where it is necessary to do so through a movement restriction. A hearing can and will review those measures when they consider any reported non-compliance with those conditions. Ros McCall. Sorry, I, I intervened slightly early there. Um, will, the, will the Minister accept that because there are no consequences of these, it's almost worth not actually handing out this as a, a, a restriction at all? Minister. I don't accept that and I don't accept that there's no consequences. It is not the case that no further action can be taken. Hearings have the power on review to take any new measures, including as a last resort, measures that can deprive the child of their liberty where necessary to safeguard or promote a child's welfare. Deprivation of liberty can be authorised for up to three months before a review is required, at which time the deprivation of liberty can be continued if still necessary. There is therefore no need for non-compliance to be a criminal charge. And to do so, as Willie Rennie has already alluded to, would undermine the Kilbrandon principles on which the hearing system is based. Now, I appreciate the member has concerns around victim support, and we will move on to discussions around that in later groupings. At the moment, I would urge the member not to press the amendment, and if it is pressed, I urge the chamber not to support it. Thank you, Minister. I call Rose McCall to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 2. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There's not much more I can add to the, the debate that's just been there. Um, I, I think this is about balance, as I've already said. This is about making sure that um, compulsory supervision orders or MRCs are actually adhered to, and, and I will be pressed in the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCall. The question, therefore, is this Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Jackie Bailey. Signing officer, I'm afraid it wouldn't connect, and I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number two in the name of Ros McCall is yes, 28, no, 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now turn to group five on children's hearing system victim information. 
I call Amendment 3 in the name of Willie Rennie, grouped with Amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7. And I call on Willie Rennie to move Amendment 3 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Hey, I'm grateful especially to Victim Support Scotland, but also Children First and Scottish Women's Aid for their assistance in understanding the issues that victims face and navigating the information sharing challenges and cases which are dealt with the children's hearing system. I'm also grateful to Ruth Maguire, Stephanie Gallaghan and Michelle Thompson, as well as Liam Kerr and Sue Webber for supporting my successful amendment at stage two against, at that time, the advice of the Minister. But finally, I'm grateful to the Minister and her excellent officials for their expla exploration of the issues with me and the production of these new amendments, which I think are even better than my original amendment at stage two. Uh, the, the bill and my amendments in this section and the next will expand the power of the principal reporter to share information as relevant for safety planning purposes. And this will not just be for a one-off event, but an ongoing information sharing process as events dictate. This will ensure that, broadly speaking, victims will have rights to information to support their safety planning in a way which is reflective of the approach in criminal proceedings, but which is appropriate for the welfare-based children's hearing system. So, broadly speaking, the information sharing rights for victims in the children's hearing system will be similar to those in the justice system. Now, bearing in mind that this affects all of those in the children's hearing system, not just the new cohort of 16 and 17 year olds, this is a significant enhancement of victims' rights for children. This is a big change as the children's hearing system has been based on the Kilbrandon principles, which puts the subject child at the centre of considerations. That remains true, but now victims will have their rights enhanced. This information sharing goes beyond just compulsory supervision orders and movement restriction conditions and covers situations which such information is required for safety planning purposes. The amendments expand the situations in which information can be shared by the principal reporter with persons affected by the ch child's behaviour or offence. The amendments strike the appropriate balance between disclosing enough information to victims to assist with their safety planning, whilst also respecting the rights and welfare of the referred child. They do this by ensuring that the principal reporter will still be required to make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis about whether to share information in consideration of a number of factors, including fundamentally whether the sharing of information would be detrimental to the best interests of the referred child or any other child. Now, amendments 3, 4, 6 and 7 build on the amendments made at stage 2 to include any interim orders made in respect of the referred child and to ensure that any variations or continuations or termination of the measures can be shared with the person who has previously requested information without the need for that person to make additional requests for information as time goes on. Now, Amendment 5 extends the information that can be shared to include other information necessary to assist safety planning by or in relation to the person requesting this information. This is a key aspect. Together, these amendments will also assist victims who have a particular concern that can either be eased by giving information, for example, that a child is deprived of their liberty for a period of time or is living out of area, or conversely, to make decisions on what safety planning they need where the restrictions on the child are ending or where there are no restrictions on the child who they wish to avoid. This is an essential element for victims who may have experienced domestic abuse or antisocial behaviour caused by, a ch by children in their areas. People need to have access to information if they need to put measures in place to avoid further contact. Victim Support Scotland have said that they are supportive of my amendments in the group, but are also strongly urging the Scottish Government to follow up the legislation 
with robust guidance on implementing the information sharing provisions in a way that ensures that victims' voices are heard. They say that the changes being implemented will require a significant cultural reform of how the children's hearing system and the SR, SCRA upholds victims' rights and needs. I intend to continue working with stakeholders, including Victim Support Scotland, to make sure that the government addresses these concerns once these amendments are passed and if this bill is passed today as well. I move Amendment 3. Thank you, Mr Rennie. I call Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I note the amendments 3 through to 7 within the group. And whilst we're supportive of these amendments on information sharing and uh, the support for victims, uh, we will be voting for them. Um, I think it's important also to go on record voicing the concerns raised again by Victim Support Scotland, and I know Mr Rennie has alluded to them. It goes back to risk assessment and the ongoing risk for victims that are currently provided for, which will cease when it comes down to the removal of the risk assessment approach, which was introduced at stage two. Victim Support Scotland remain concerned that there are too many caveats to allow the principal reporter not to provide information to a victim or victim support organisation. Victims have continuously given feedback that they have not received any information from the principal reporter, despite provisions in place to provide this currently. And they also highlight that it's a significant disparity between the support that the CHS can provide to victims and what they receive. If we're to fully to support everyone through this process, we need to understand how it's currently working, where it's falling down and how it can be rectified. So I would urge the government to look at some of the amendments where we're looking at reviews and reports and to include this as a review for victims to ensure that uh, it's properly supported going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCall. I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank Mr Rennie firstly for his amendments, his willingness to work with the government and his careful consideration of the, the important aspect of this bill. This bill will allow all children to have the benefit where appropriate of the welfare-based system, but at the same time allow proportionate and necessary information to be shared with persons affected by a referred child's behaviour. My officials and I have had in-depth engagement with Victim Support Scotland on these matters, as I know Mr Rennie and other members have. The Government has been clear over scrutiny of the Bill about our commitment to supporting victims, especially child victims and their families, no matter which system deals with an offence case. Care must be taken to protect privacy rights and to avoid compromising the focus of the hearing system on child welfare. Crucially, children's hearings are not criminal justice settings and the rights of the victim must be balanced against the rights of the referred child. These amendments achieve that and I would urge members to support the amendments in this group. Thank you, Minister. I call on Willie Rennie to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 3. Uh, can I thank uh, Ros McCall and uh, the Minister for their comments. Can I just reiterate, the golden principle in this is that information will be shared on the grounds of safety planning. And that has got to be our first and foremost consideration um, for this provision. It goes beyond just movement restriction conditions and compulsory supervision orders and covers all areas where safety planning is a consideration. And Ros McCall is right. The take-up of information has been very low just now. It's in the order of 14%, and we need to ramp that up considerably, but we need to do it in the right way to make sure it's appropriate for the victim but also for the subject child. Um, and that's why I think these amendments strike that right balance. Um, the final thing to consider is to, to, re to reiterate my point earlier that this is a significant advance for children of all ages who are dealt with in the children's hearing system, not just 16 and 17 year olds. Um, and that allows for an, an equivalence in broad terms with those that are provided in the criminal justice system. That is a significant development, and that's something that I'm particularly pleased that we've managed to get to. But I think it's the right balance, it's the appropriate balance, and it's a significant enhancement. Thank you. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr Rennie. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Is the Parliament agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7, all in the name of Willie Rennie and all previously debated. I invite Willie Rennie to move Amendments 4 to 7 on block. Moved. I would ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on Amendments 4 to 7. 
No member objects. I therefore, uh, uh, I therefore put the question that amendments four to seven are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. We now turn to group six on children's hearing system victim support. I call amendment eight in the name of Willie Rennie, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I call on Willie Rennie to move amendment eight and to speak to all amendments in the group. I'm sorry to have dragged all those members back from the tea room uh, for no purpose at all. Uh, they might be able to go back again because I hope there's unanimity uh, on these set of amendments as well. And I want to move the amendment eight in my name. As referred to earlier today, at stage two of the bill, the Education, Children and Young People Committee passed my amendment inserting section 6b into the bill in addition to the government's amendments inserting section 6a. However, given that these sections overlap in some respects and conflict in others, they needed to be reconciled ahead of stage 3. Amendments 8 to 17 and 22, together with the removal of section 6b amendment 23, will do just that. These amendments are necessary to ensure the provisions are clear and workable in practice. I am content that any aspects of Section 6B that are not reflected in Section 6A are not necessary given the overall package of improved measures provided by my amendments in this group. And my amendments debated in the previous group, in particular the three-tier approach which I brought forward at Stage 2 is still included but in a different format. Victims will have access to more detailed general information of the children's hearing system, will be entitled to person-specific information where appropriate, and will have access to other information necessary to assist safety planning. My amendments in this group, therefore, extend and improve the new regulation-making power in Section 179D of the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011, which is being inserted by Section 6A of the Bill. Amendment 8 requires regulations under new Section 179D to establish a single point of contact for persons entitled to request information in relation to decisions by the principal reporter or a children's hearing, where those persons have been affected by a child's offence or behaviour. Amendments 9, 10, 11, 13 and 16 are minor and technical amendments which, taken together, reflect that a single point of contact will be set up. Amendment 14 enables regulations to ensure that the information provided by the single point of contact to affected persons is provided in a way that is accessible to the person receiving it. Amendment 15 allows for the developing of regulations for the sharing of information between the single point of contact and key agencies in the children's hearing system, including local authorities who implement compulsory supervision orders, the chief constable, the principal reporter, the national convener and their associated corporate bodies, CHS and SCRA. Amendments 12 and 22 would ensure that the regulations can also provide for relevant information to be provided to and by the single point of contact. This includes particular information about the children's hearing system, such as details about the interaction between the children's hearing system and the criminal justice system. It also includes information about the action that can be taken by a children's hearing, such as the measures that can be included in a compulsory supervision order and the process for reviewing that action. Amendment 17 future proofs the information sharing provisions by allowing sections 179A to 179C in the 2011 Act to be modified by regulations under new section 179D without the need for primary legislation. This would enable a move from the current opt-in information service being provided by the SCRA to an opt-out service if and if there is an evidence base to do so. I understand that Women's Aid 
are concerned by this Amendment 17 and, they, and they, that it could have unintended consequences for victims looking to access information. They are right to say that the pathways of information sharing between the principal reporter, support services and the victim require consultation with a range of stakeholders. They are also right to say that the development of an information sharing service must also seek to align with existing policy and practice developments such as Bernshus and the hearing system redesign work. But I want to reassure them that this amendment is simply an enabling power to move to an opt-out system if the evidence supports it. SCRA and Victim Support Scotland are currently undertaking research to explore the reasons behind the low take-up rates of the SCRA Victim Information Service. This amendment would also enable changes to be made in future relating to the operation of information sharing. I expect, however, that the new single point of contact service will allow victims to be more equipped to exercise their rights to seek information if they wish to do so. There has been considerable concern by the very limited uptake by victims of the existing information rights, which is in the region of only 14 per cent. My amendment at stage two had included an opt-out system whereby victims would receive information unless they objected. Whilst this would increase take-up rates, I do accept that it could lead to information being shared with victims, which may not be in their best interests. That is why the research being undertaken by the SCRA and Victim Support Scotland is important, and my amendment allows for that opt-out system if the evidence supports it, as I have just said. I also believe that the new and meaningful information rights, together with the existence of the single point of contact, will improve the numbers of victims accessing such information. These new arrangements will support people to understand their options and be supported to make the right choice for them. Amendment 21 changes the parliamentary procedure applicable to regulations made under new section 179D of the 2011 Act, and that they will be subject to the affirmative procedure rather than the negative procedure. This will give this Parliament the chance to fully debate and scrutinise the regulations and, importantly, the final say on whether they are approved. Amendment 18 simply makes a technical change to the consultation duty in new section 179D4 to reflect that the change of the procedure. It makes sure that the Scottish Ministers consult with the listed consultees before laying draft regulations before the Parliament for approval. I am satisfied that these measures, taken together with my amendments debated in the last group, will bring victims in the children's hearing system broadly in line with what we can expect in the criminal justice system in terms of their ability to obtain relevant information and information to plan for their safety in the event that this is required. Accordingly, Amendment 23 removes Section 6b, which is no longer required. I also fully support Ruth Maguire's Amendment 48, which allows close scrutiny of the operation of these important measures. I am confident that the provisions assist in striking the appropriate balance between giving a victim enough information to feel supported, safe and empowered, while also respecting the overall ethos of the children's hearing system and indeed the rights of children and young people. I am grateful for Victim Support Scotland for supporting my amendments in this group and for emphasising the importance of the single point of contact. However, they have also made clear that the future single point of contact must provide support to all victims regardless of their own age and must uphold the rights and the best interests of the persons who appear to have been harmed. These are important issues and it is crucial that as the government develops the single point of contact that they will address them. I move the amendments in my name. Thank you, Mr Rennie. I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in the group. 
Thank you, President Officer. I fully support all of Winnie Re Willie Rennie's amendments in this group, and I want to put on record my appreciation for his work on these amendments to ensure that we have a coherent, comprehensive system for a new single point of contact for support services to be established in relation to children's hearings. This will be funded by the Scottish Government. I consider this will be a hugely beneficial to support those who need it and will assist with the implementation of the new provisions in the Bill for Victims. Similarly, I very much welcome Ruth Maguire's Amendment 48 in this respect and thank her for bringing this forward. The periodic reporting duty which it provides for will allow ministers to take stock of how effectively the service is meeting the needs of victims. Throughout the progress of this bill, the Government has recognised the importance of listening and responding to the voices of those with lived experience. So I particularly welcome the provision in Ms Maguire's amendment requiring the Scottish Ministers to listen to the feedback of people to whom support services are provided. I also appreciate the intention behind Ms McCall's Amendment 24, but unfortunately Scottish Government cannot support it. To be clear, I have every sympathy for any victim of any offence, whether the perpetrator is identified, whether someone is held accountable for the offence, whether they are required as a witness in criminal proceedings or as a witness in a children's referral proof. As noted previously, the children's hearing system and the criminal justice system are very distinct systems. It is not possible nor appropriate to import measures from one system into the other without tailoring them to the nuances of that system and the individuals who have to interact with it. There are certain elements of the proposed amendment which, given the nature and the purpose of children's hearings, risk setting unrealistic expectations for victims, such as a right to effectively participate in proceedings where appropriate, or to receive compensation for loss or expenses incurred during and after the proceedings. I believe that the best way to ensure that victims are informed and supported is through a support service tailored to their needs, delivered by qualified and experienced service providers. Now, I have listened carefully to the concerns raised by victim support organisations and have worked intensively with, with them and members of the Education, Children and Young People Committee to improve the provision of support and information to victims through measures in this bill. The new bespoke single point of contact for support services will have an important uh, role in improving the support and information available to victims. This will include advice on rights and how to exercise them. Those who provide support services will be trained and qualified to help victims. The Government has already committed to funding this new national service. It is essential that we work jointly with the Scottish Children's Reporters Administration and victim support organisations to get the service right for those it will serve and that we focus resources on the development of this service. The consultation process, which will take place before, regula before regulations establishing the service are brought forward, will help us to ensure that there are no gaps in the support provided and that existing services are joined up. It is also right that once the single point of contact is established and operational, there is a meaningful assessment and regular review of the effectiveness of the support services that are provided. On that basis, I consider the other amendments in this group will adequately ensure that victims' needs and interests are appropriately taken into account and addressed. I urge members, therefore, to support the amendments in Willie Rennie's name and Ruth Maguire's Amendment 48 and to reject Ms McCall's Amendment 24. Finally, I would also urge members to support my own amendments 19 and 20. These make minor technical adjustments to the list of persons who must be consulted before regulations are brought forward to establish the new single point of contact for support services for those victims requiring it in relation to children's hearing proceedings. Two of the main bodies currently listed are Scottish Children's Reporter Administration and Children's Hearing Scotland. However, the consultation should actually be with those bodies' respective duty bearers, the Principal Reporter and the National Convener, who will each play an important role in developing these regulations together with persons who are already providing support services. Thank you, Minister. I call on Ruth McGuire to speak to Amendment 48 and other amendments in the group. Ms McGuire. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. As victim supports state in their briefing, significant progress has been made around the information that can be shared with victims. I too am highly supportive of my committee colleague Willie Rennie's amendments on this issue and of Amendment 8 in this group, which establishes a new single point of contact for support services, specifically for the children's hearing system. Victims of offences or behaviour by children being dealt with in the hearing system currently have access to limited information, and committee heard in quite stark terms during evidence session, sessions the impact of this and the real consequences for their safety, recovery and well-being. It is crucial that they can access the information they need to assist them with any safety planning requirements. The introduction of a single point of contact is therefore very welcome, and I hope that this, along with um, Willie Rennie's amendments debated in Group 5, will make a meaningful difference to victims. I want to thank um, the Minister for her engagement and support on my Amendment 48, um, which places a duty on Scottish Ministers to report on the operation of this new service every two years, following consultation with the key agencies involved in the children's hearing system. The review is required to assess the effectiveness of support services and identify any steps needed to improve things as a result of that assessment. As part, I will give way. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful to Ruth Maguire to give way, and can I compliment her on the almost hopeful success with regard um, to her amendment? And doesn't it speak volumes that the ability to capture the data from people who are actually processing through the, the, the system is so important, particularly with various enactments that are coming down the line, so that we actually understand what the lived experience through this system is like? Ruth Maguire. I think Martin Whitfield makes that, that, that point very well there, yeah. Um, the review is required to assess the effectiveness of support services and identify any steps needed to improve things as a result of that assessment. As part of ensuring the delivery of a high-quality support service for victims, meaningful assessment and scrutiny of its impact in practice will be critical, as will be the implementation of the lessons learned. Really importantly, as the Minister stated in her comments, this review will be informed by those running and using the service. To enable scrutiny and ensure that the, victim, the rights of victims in the children's hearing system are kept in focus, a report on each review will be laid before Parliament. I am sure colleagues across the Chamber will welcome the opportunity to take part in that scrutiny and do just that. Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Maguire. I call Ros McCall to speak to Amendment 24 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, would state up front that we are uh, supportive of all the amendments in the group. And I'll limit my comments uh, to Amendment 24 in my name. I thank Scottish Women's Aid and Victim Support Scotland for their support on this amendment. This amendment is to review the rights of victims within the children's hearing system. And I note the comments that the Minister has made, but I believe that we should be doing all that we can, and I don't think that we're superimposing one system onto another. I can echo the comments made by Scottish Women's Aid when they say too little is known about victims' experiences of children's hearing system. It's imperative we look to gather a clearer picture to inform future work and service development. As per the UNCRC, a, ch a child victim must have their rights upheld and information on this particular aspect is minimal at best. So this amendment seeks to address this disparity by asking for a review, placing a duty on Scottish ministers to publish a report reviewing the rights of victims within the children's hearing system. And I will be pressing the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCall. I call Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and I just want to say that Scottish Labour will be supporting the amendments in, in this group. We'll also um, be support, would have been supporting the um, amendments in the previous group, but um, we'll know that now because we did that. But I meant to say at the time that actually the work that had gone into the um, amendments in that section and in this particular section si since um, stage two, I think, is particularly important. Um, when I brought amendments on um, victim information at stage two, I brought them um, specifically on safety planning and specifically on the affirmative procedure um, for the setting up of a single point of contact. And it's that I want to speak to briefly just now. The safety planning aspect of information sharing is, is incredibly crucial. And I think that's been picked up in not just the information that can be shared, but also um, hopefully will be strengthened again um, in regulations. But given 
addressing some of the concerns of victims' organisations that still stand and some concerns of some of the children's organisations around this um, that still stand, I think it's really important that amendments that seek to put regulations in the affirmative um, procedure are crucial because they will allow Parliament to have that oversight and to make sure that victims um, victims' requests, as well as um, the requests from other uh, organisations, are borne out in the single point of contact. And for that reason, we support these amendments and in particular are, are pleased to see that they are of, the regulation will be in the affirmative procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. I call on Willie Rennie to wind up and to press and withdraw Amendment 8. Uh, I think I've said enough. Uh, I'll move the amendment in my name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr Rennie. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is agreed. I call amendments 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 and 18, all in the name of Willie Rennie and all previously debated. I invite Willie Rennie to move amendments 9 to 18 on block. It moved. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 9 to 18? No member objects. The question is, therefore, that amendments 9 to 18 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is therefore agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 8. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 8. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Willie Rennie, already debated with Amendment 8. Willie Rennie to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 22 in the name of Willie Rennie, already debated with Amendment 8. Willie Rennie to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has agreed. I call Amendment 48 in the name of Ruth Maguire, already debated with Amendment 8. Ruth Maguire to move or not move? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Willie Rennie, already debated with Amendment 8. Willie Rennie to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has agreed. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 8. Ros McCall to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 24 in the name of Ros McCall is yes, 43. No, 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I would advise members that we will now have a short comfort break of 10 minutes and we will resume business at just shortly after 5pm when I hope to see you all back on time. Thank you. <laughs>